Hey, it's Patrice Tart with MillBuzz.com. I'm here in the halls of Congress tonight to speak with the House Democratic Caucus along with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. This event is a second annual event hosted by Congresswoman Maxine Waters and it's called the Millennial Media Row. Stay tuned, we have a lot of interviews coming up. We are here with Congresswoman Maxine Waters for her second annual Millennial Media Row event. Thank yes. you so much for inviting us. You're so welcome and I'm so pleased and delighted that you're here. Thank you. You're Thanks. Welcome. So my question is, what is your message to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and the direction of the country? Uh, my message, first of all, is don't give up. Okay. And don't feel like, you know, you're so victimized that you can do nothing. Uh, We've got to get rid of Donald Trump. We do. I want him impeached. <laughs> and I hope that we can bring our membership to that kind of understanding where impeachment proceedings will get started. Okay. But if not, uh, we have to do it in the elections in 2020. Yes. And I certainly think from all of the information that we're seeing uh, that even some of those people who voted for him are not willing to do it again. He's been divisive. He's been dishonest. He's obstructed justice. Yes, he and he has colluded with Putin and the oligarchs of Russia. What yes. more do we need to know about him? Right. That's true. You're he, right. He qualifies for impeachment. He does. He does. And also, how can millennials become more involved in the political arena? Well, you know, first of all, I want to commend millennials because they have created a discussion that had not been going on before Bernie Sanders' campaign. Yes. And they began to emerge. And as you guys emerge, you created a discussion that now everybody has to pay attention to. You know, every other word out of people's mouths is the millennials said this, or the millennials are doing this, or the millennials don't eat this kind of food. They don't dress <laughs> this kind of way. They don't live in these kind of places. Millennials are creating a whole new style, yes. a whole new lifestyle. And so don't think that millennials don't have influence. Okay. You have significant influence. And the involvement that you have politically is really surfacing in a real way. We have millennials that have come into Congress, who just got elected to office, who will have a say. And of course, just look at the broadcast and the podcast and what's going on here. Right. This is important. You're in the Congress of the United States. Well, you know, we're not just listening to CNN and ABC and right. CBS and anymore. And everybody knows if we want to talk to young people, we got to talk to you guys. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you have influence and it's growing. Okay. And we're going to work with you in every way that we can to make sure that the quality of life that you deserve really does take place because it is what America promised you. Right. Remember how they said, be good, be nice? Yes. You know, go to work and don't make any fuss, don't make any noise, and you're going to get promoted and all of that. It didn't happen. Right. It doesn't happen that way. Right. But now you know it and you're prepared to do something about it and yes. you've got people who are prepared to work with you to do it. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So I appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Congressman T.J. Cox from California's 21st Congressional District, which is right in the very heart of California, the San Joaquin Valley, a very agricultural district, uh, some 70% Latino. But, uh, you know, this is where it, it's the nation's bread basket and fruit basket. We have so many agricultural products that are grown there. Uh, and it's one of the more challenging districts. We're one of the most environmentally abused regions in America. Very, lots of problems with clean air and clean water. Uh, educational attainment. Fewer than 8% of our adults have a college education. And so our challenges are legion, but I can tell you, there's nothing more gratifying than uh, seeing the commitment and the grit of the hardworking families in my district. Congressman Cox, our first question, what was your journey uh, to Congress? My journey to Congress really started uh, and it probably 15 years ago, no, actually closer to 20 years ago, uh, through volunteering with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we moved to, to the uh, Central Valley, to Fresno, uh, for, my, for my wife, who's a pediatric intensive care physician, to take a job uh, serving the children and the families there in Central Valley. And with the background that I had in engineering, construction, and development, and in fact, I spent a number of years working in Africa, in, in Ghana. Uh, I'm probably the only member that's actually uh, uh, the ceremonial uh, chief of uh, African tribe, <laughs> actually. But uh, uh, I took a job volunteering with Habitat for Humanity, and that experience led me to start uh, a community development organization that was tasked with, a, had a pretty simple task to make a positive difference in the lives of the people there in the valley. And we've done just that. We've created health clinics and job training facilities, 
clean energy plants, uh, homeless campuses, and so on. And so that just gave me a perfect platform to say, I know what we should be doing in our communities, and I've got a track record of, deli of delivering, and that's what I'm going to continue to do in Congress. That's amazing. So our next question is, what are your priorities with the 116th Congress? The priorities in the 116th Congress, one, is to get things done for the American people. You know, a quality, affordable health care for all. Let's solve the immigration issues once and for all with comprehensive immigration reform. Let's really start focusing on cleaning our air and our water. Let's train our workforce and our young men and women for the jobs of the future. And so, uh, you know, that's those are things that we all know where we need to go. We just need the political will and the capital to be able to do that. And that's what we have with this Congress. So with the shutdown as well, what are some of the lasting effects that you've seen uh, affect our American people with that shutdown? Uh, the lasting effects? I think everyone knows that. Uh, don't mess with Nancy. All right? <laughs> You're, all right? That's absolutely right. I, I, I tell you what, you know, uh, Donald Trump, you know, he should know uh, owning a casino. The house always wins, yeah. and this house is led by a fantastic leader in uh, Speaker Pelosi. I, I can tell you. But but here's the thing that uh, you may have known. I, I brought up some inter uh, some legislation to be able to help the affected workers by letting them borrow from the earnings that were owed them. Because I think we all know. I mean, it's just wrong to, be, to force people to work and not pay them. That wouldn't go over well with anybody, right? And, and so, so I applaud the workers that stuck it out, that had to endure this shutdown, uh, that were really affected, and I thank them for all their work and commitment, and we're gonna make sure that this never happens again. Now, what's your message to the American people who are concerned with Donald Trump in, in the state of America right now? Well, I, I think you can see is that uh, we, the voice of the people, they spoke on November, uh, 2018 and they spoke very loud they delivered the largest uh, democratic uh, takeover since Watergate for 40 some years that was a complete repudiation of Donald Trump all right and so uh, and so now we saw we've seen what's happened recently and I can tell you the people are on the side of the people we all know what we need to get done once again quality affordable health care for all immigration reform clean air clean water uh, the things that are really going to make a positive difference in our lives. Now, you spoke on the diversity of the Congress now. Yeah. What, what are some of the things we can expect from having such a diverse Congress? You know, uh, really, I tell you, our diversity is really our strength. We come from so many different walks of life, and, you know, and it's not diversity just for diversity's sake. It comes from those different experiences. I don't have the experience of somebody that's been working in the inner city. I have the experience of somebody that's been working in rural communities, right? I don't have uh, the, the experience of, uh, of somebody that uh, used to be working in a factory. I've got the experience of somebody that used to be working in the fields. And that's, that's what's so nice about this Congress. The, the range of experiences that we have personally in our work life are all going to be uh, distilled down to benefit the people of, of, uh, of America. One last question for you. What can millennials do to aid Congress or, or get more into the political process? I can tell you, they can do exactly what they did uh, in November. I, I tell you what, you may, you may know that my race, we were the 40th race called. We are the last race called in the nation. And I only won by 800 votes. But I can tell you what, the day before the election, I knew I was going to win. And the reason why I knew I was going to win is I was at... Uh, at a CVS, and I was checking out, buying some stuff, and, and a young man who literally looked like he was about 15 or 16 goes, oh my gosh, T.J. Cox, I'm going to vote for you. And I said, Eddie, are, are you old enough to vote? And, and he goes, I'm 18, right? I'm a freshman. He goes, me and all my friends, we're going to vote for you. And so the, so the fact that you have these young uh, uh, millennials that are getting out here to vote, the non-classical voters, and they know that their voices are going to be heard and they're going to continue to be heard, that gives me hope for America and for the millennials. Congressman Cox, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. You. I'm Suzanne Bonamici, and I represent a district in the great state of Oregon, the northwest part of the state. So okay, I have great. part of Portland in the district and then all the way out to the beautiful Oregon coast. Okay, thank you for that. So what was your journey into the U.S. Congress? 
Not a typical path. Uh, a lot of times people think that everyone in Congress wanted to be in Congress their whole lives. And <laughs> yes. Honestly, I wanted to be a dancer when I was growing up. And I ended up uh, working my way through community college. I got really interested in law. So I, I went to community college and then college and law school and still didn't put together the connection that I could be someone who was making the policy that could improve people's lives. So it took me a long time. I eventually ended up volunteering on a couple of political campaigns and then ran for the state legislature. Okay. So I served in the state legislature and then uh, after serving in the state house and senate, I've been here almost seven years. This is my seven year anniversary this week. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. I came in a special election in the middle of the Congress. Okay, very good. And my next question is, what are your priorities in the 116th Congress? Sure. I, my passion is education uh, and the whole continuum, early childhood education, great um, public schools, K through 12, and importantly, a debt-free higher education. When I worked my way through school, it was not a burden. Um, I did it on my own and I had work study and some grants and a few right. loans. But that's not what I'm hearing from people today. Higher right. education is too expensive. It is. So making sure that, number one, we're, we're helping students who already have student loans okay. so they can lower their rates or get into income-based repayment. And number two, make, just making college affordable, especially so we can close that, that gap. Uh, we want everyone, it's, everyone should be able to go to college and not be hindered because yes. of lack of resources. Yes. So that's number one priority is education. Number two, okay. climate change. Right. Uh, we are seeing after that last national climate assessment, we're seeing um, this, some, some people say, well, that was a wake up call. No, that was an alarm. <laughs> we need to take action. We need to be bold. Right. Uh, sure. We need to, to take steps immediately uh, and create great jobs in renewable energy. Yes, that's awesome. And um, what can the American people expect from the, de the Democratic majority in the House, which is the most diverse in history? Uh, well, I think they can expect that their Congress looks a lot more like the United States of America. We're a really diverse country, and it's about time that, that we have a diverse Congress. We still have a lot of work to do, yes. although we've made tremendous progress, especially in this last uh, Congress with the additional women, mm -hmm. uh, Native American women, uh, Muslim women. It's just a, an amazing um, diversity that is going to bring different voices. Right. And, but reflective of the people in this country. I mean, we are a diverse country, so I'm very excited about it, and I think people can expect um, that their Congress will be making decisions, um, understanding that this is a, a country that is, is built by immigrants and diverse, uh, and hopefully our decisions will reflect that. Yes, I think it will. Sounds great. Thanks, Patricia. You're welcome. And what are the lasting impacts of the government shutdown? I know that's something that's major oh, right now. We're yes. still kind of like, we're out of it, but we're kind of still in well, it. we're so. out of it for now. Right. We're, we're really hopeful. <laughs> well, I have to say that a government shutdown is not good for anybody. Right. Uh, I think this this administration, the Trump administration, has shown their disrespect for federal employees, starting out with freezing pay and then not really fearing that there was a, a sh showing, showing incredible insensitivity. Right. I so agree. we saw in Oregon, I have a lot of Coast Guard members, and our our coast is our border, and our Coast Guard was out there working to keep people safe and to interdict drugs that are being smuggled, and they're not being paid and expected to work. Yeah. And then we had TSA, you know, at the airport, and our air traffic controllers raising alarms. Yes. Yeah, so I'm proud to say that Oregonians really stepped up to support people though, the federal workers in Portland, the restaurants all came together oh, and awesome. they took breakfast, lunch and dinner out to the airport for the TSA workers oh, and, the, incredible. and the um, air traffic controllers over on the Coast Guard, some of the spouses formed a, they, they got, made a food pantry and okay. they saw a lot of volunteers, but they shouldn't have to do that. That's, that's right, so I agree. I know that many of us are committed to making sure, and this is true on both sides of the aisle, there's a lot of people who say, we don't want this to happen again. Yes. The government shutdown is good for Anyway. It isn't. It's it's been really hard, especially I know people that are government employees, um, and so I've seen the struggles that they have, they've had right. to go through. It's been really challenging. Challenging. Yes, uh, oh, it has been. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we hope it doesn't happen again. Right. right. <laughs> and what is your message to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and the future direction of our country? Get involved. Okay. Speak up. Speak out. And we've seen that since the 2016 election. Yeah. I've seen so many more people coming to the town hall meetings writing, emailing, um, and getting involved. Right. And that's like a good thing. 
um, and don't give up hope, things will get better. Yes, and that actually segues into my next question. How can us millennials become more involved in the political space? Oh, there's a lot of room for that. And, you know, I mentioned coming to town hall meetings, reaching out. Um, sometimes people think they don't need to write to members of Congress if, if they agree with what their positions are. Right. But, but no, we, we want people to, to, right. to let us know yes. um, so that we can understand where they're coming from and what their values and priorities are. Okay. And I also have to say that there are so many uh, opportunities now for people to run for Congress. I mean, we, have, we have millennials here in Congress who, who were just elected and you have the youngest people elected to Congress here in uh, and it's very, very exciting. And it is. we need the voices of millennials because millennials are our future leaders. Yes, I like that. Thank you so much. I'm Jonathan Talley with Mailbuzz. If you would like to introduce yourself. I'm Sylvia Garcia and I'm from Houston, Texas. I represent District 29, which includes Houston and uh, about five other cities, Aguilina Park, Pasadena, South Houston, Descendo City, and God, I forgot that they're going to be upset, but I can't remember the fifth one. <laughs> I'm sure they'll forgive you. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're doing a great job, though. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your journey to Congress. Well, uh, I've come from a circle. I actually ran in 1992, the first year of the woman. Uh, and I came out third and didn't win, obviously. Uh, but I managed to, to uh, get in elected office uh, and then uh, be elected city controller in Houston. Which is, uh, uh, and then after that, I was the elected Harris County Commissioner. And then after that, I was a state senator. Uh, so then this became vacant when uh, my member of Congress, that beat me in 92, retired. So when he announced he was running, I thought, I can do this. I was ready to do it. Now I can do it. So I ran and won uh, in a field of seven I, on my primary without a runoff. Uh, and then I won my uh, general election uh, with 75% of the vote. So for me, it's a comfort circle. I ran the first year of the woman in, now the second year of the woman. Mm -hmm. So how about your, what about your priorities for the 116th Congress? Well, for me, you know, the district is 77% Latino. I was, by the way, uh, one of two uh, the first Latinos to ever be elected uh, to Congress from the state of Texas. It never had happened before, now there's two of us. Uh, Bernard Gitzkobar from El Paso and myself. So for me, it's a Latino district, it's a working class district. Uh, so it's, it's all about jobs, good jobs that holds families together. It's about education. Um, we all want to make sure that our kids get a good education and that they don't graduate with high school debt and that they are able to either get a job, get training, or get somewhere uh, uh, to have a good job. And third is, is health care. It's really important uh, to make sure that everyone uh, is able to go to see the doctor when, when they're sick. It's always important to make sure that our kids can get their shots and our seniors can get their care. So health care is vitally important. And fourth, again, because it is a Latino district, immigration reform. Comprehensive immigration reform, um, the pathway to citizenship, uh, to make sure that everyone can succeed and fulfill their American dream. Which is super, super important. So what, what can the American people expect from the Democratic majority in the House, which is the biggest, it's, it's the most, I'm sorry, let me do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the most so, diverse. Universe, yes. So what can, the, what can the American people expect from the Democratic par Party in the House, which is the most diverse in history? Well, I think they can expect um, to, to know that, that they now have a voice. You know, the, dem the majority is, is all about making sure um, that we do the things that we need to do for the working families of this country. You know, we are for the people. We're not for special interests. We're not for, you know, corruption in government. We're not for any of the things that, that are things of the past. We want to move forward, uh, and we want to be for the people. So I think they can expect us to be responsive. They can expect us, expect us to be there, but we've got their back. Now, now, what do you feel the lasting impacts of this government shutdown? 
never have been for the American people. Well, I think regretfully it's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of uh, families that are now struggling to, to still waiting to see when they're going to get that back pay, still waiting to get that full check. Uh, and I think it's going to leave uh, uh, some, some debt, you know, late fees, delinquent fees. Uh, some of them have had to go through uh, receiving notices from the mortgage company, their, their car loan, they, you know, they're going to repossess the car or, or foreclose on their homes. And that's just regrettable. And we're trying to work with banks, work with credit unions, work with, with uh, dealerships to make sure that they not get assessed these fees. Because it's to no fault of their own that they're in this predicament. And I think we're also going to probably have to deal with some of the trauma, the stress, uh, you know, that, that all this uh, imposed not just on the worker, but on their families. Uh, I went to a home of a TSA worker in Houston, uh, and I was just really touched with how it was really impacting not just the father who was a TSA worker, but the wife who was dependent on one of those machines to keep her heart worried that they'd already gotten a notice from the light company about the high bill that they couldn't pay. And she needed that electricity to charge us. So there was a lack of that. So she wore out. Then I met their four girls. I knew they were like from uh, six or seven to about 15 or 16. You know, that's a lot of stuff to me. I asked them because one of them was at the school that required uniforms. I said, well, do they have the uniforms? You know, do they have the fees for their school lunch? Do they have the fees for any of the activities that they're, they're used to doing? That's lasting trauma, not just on the father, but the mother and the little girl. And that's something we're going to have to wrestle with. It's going to take some time. And remember, this is temporary three weeks. And, and so there's still that uncertainty. There's still that stress of not knowing whether this is really the end or whether they're going to go back to another shutdown situation in three weeks. So the Democratic majority is, is again, we voted nine times to reopen the government. Now we're in negotiations. We're going to work real hard to make sure that this shutdown is over and that we're, there's no going back. Yeah. Yeah. Two last questions for you. So, how can millennials become more involved in the political process? Well, I think they, they um, need to continue to do what they're doing. If you look at any of the movements that have gotten us to where we are here, whether it was the Women's March here you know, a year ago, whether it was Black Lives Matter, whether it was you know, All Lives Matter and the, 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 gun, the gun debate, you know, all that, quite frankly, you know, yes, especially the Women's March, there's a lot of women on the streets, but there's a lot of millennials. Black Lives Matter, you go to those events. A lot of, a lot of millennials. So I think millennials have been at the forefront of all of the movements that have gotten us to work for our today because they put all the energy from the streets to the ballot box. So we need to continue to do that. We need to stay energized. We need to stay focused. And they need to know that there is a voice now. We're here. We're diverse, diverse uh, majority. Uh, many of our members are, are millennial. Uh, so they have a voice. So they need to stay involved. And they need to make a commitment. Uh, to, to voting in, not just this time because they were excited, but to continue doing it because otherwise they just won't have a voice. We have one last question for you, and we appreciate your time. Uh, what's your message to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and the future election of our country? Well, I, I just want them to, you know, not lose faith, to continue hoping. Wow. Uh, I think it's important that uh, we don't lose faith. It's important that we uh, stay uh, concerned and involved in, and frankly, a lot of prayer, because our country is, 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 is on the point of, of, uh, of losing a lot of its stature and infrastructure within itself, but also a lot of stature around the world. You know, we don't want 
a wall to be a symbol of this country. We don't want that message to go to all the rest of the world. That's not who we are. That should not symbolize our values. It should be the statute of women. It should be that Lady Justice and Tommy are dumb. It should be the things that make America great, you know, our flag, our belief in belief, our faith. Uh, in, in a being tolerant. Remember, we all got children. We've always stood for that. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Love the good time. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. My name is Barbara Lee. I'm a member of Congress, and I represent uh, the 13th Congressional District, including Oakland, Wakanda territory. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All right, so my first question is, what was your journey to the U.S. Congress? Well, I actually uh, worked with Shirley Chisholm in the oh, day. Wow. She got me involved Impressive. in politics. She forced me to register the vote when okay. I wasn't, because I was a black student union president at most college. Nice. And then I ended up working as an intern and then became chief of staff to the late Congressman Ron Dellums, who was a warrior, a statesman who I missed very much. And so that was sort of my path. Then I was in, uh, went back to California because I worked here for eight years. Okay. Uh, was elected to the California legislature, the assembly and the senate, and then when Ron retired, I ran for Congress. Very nice. That is a an, an, an interesting journey. Yeah, started as an intern, yeah. chief of staff, member of Congress. Awesome. And um, what are your priorities in the 116th Congress? Okay, gosh, I tell you, I've always wanted to make sure that the Democratic Caucus address poverty as a top priority issue. Okay. We fight for the middle class all the time, but you very seldom hear us fighting for people who are poor and low income. And so I'm raising that now as chair of the task force on poverty and opportunity to make sure that all of the issues around poverty elimination are addressed. But secondly, I'm uh, working on my uh, Marijuana Justice Act. You know, okay. I co-chair the Cannabis Caucus, and I think it's oh, important. Wow. For uh, members of Congress to understand why we need to uh, support a restorative justice fund for those who've been convicted of marijuana charges yes. and expunge the records and deschedule it from the list of controlled substances. Okay. And so I'm working on that as well as equity issues in the marijuana and cannabis industry. And uh, it's an important issue because we know so many African American young people have been wrongfully incarcerated or charged with yes. unjust laws. Yes. So this is a path, one of the paths to crack that school to prison pipeline. Right. And so I hope that uh, as co-chair of the Cannabis Caucus that you guys can rally around the bills that we're doing and yes, tell we members of Congress to support all of my legislation. Okay, that's a huge impact and we definitely need that. Yeah. So that's good. All right, so what are the lasting impacts of the government shutdown? The lasting impacts of government shutdown are horrendous. First of all, so many people uh, are, are traumatized. I mean, can you imagine not getting a paycheck and not being able to make, not being able to pay your rent, your mortgage, your credit rating goes down. Mm -hmm. I know many of my constituents who had to stop sending their children to child care or daycare, so you're interrupting their lives. Mm -hmm. But also, when you look at the federal workforce, you're talking about 20% African-Americans because the federal government has been the major employer historically of African Americans because the private sector, of course, has discriminated and continues against African Americans. My grandfather was a letter carrier. He had a degree, spoke fluent Spanish, worked in the postal service for 35 years. My mother was a social security uh, worker. And these were jobs that provided dignity, they could take care of their families. And so that's the history. And now you have a large percentage of the federal workforce who are African American who got impacted by this shutdown, and that is really wrong, and it's, okay. it's um, very sad, and we're fighting to make sure this never happens again. Finally, let me say I have a constituent, African American TSA worker. Eight of his family members were uh, shut down, shut out. No. All worked for the federal government, and they couldn't borrow from each other. They couldn't support each other because every yeah. single one of those eight Government. family members were hit yeah. by the shot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's so sad. I'm glad that it's over. Yeah. We don't know if it's, if it's actually going to be over with, but we'll see. Well, I'm on the conference committee. Okay. Uh, trying to help negotiate 
a resolve to this. Okay. Uh, we're working hard. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul Tonko, and I represent New York's 20th Congressional District. That's the capital region of New York, with the uh, capital city of Albany, and surrounding communities like Saratoga Springs, Schenectady, Troy, and my hometown of Amsterdam. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And my pleasure. The first question we would like to know is, what was your path to Congress? My path to Congress was serving in the county board, on the county board, in my home county of Montgomery County in upstate New York. And I had done that in my uh, late 20s. I did that for about eight and a half years and realized that there were additional things I wanted to do that I had to accomplish at either the state or federal level. I ran for the State Assembly of New York, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, served for 25 years in the State Assembly, my last 15 of which were as energy chair. And uh, now I'm, I have completed my 10 years in uh, the House of Representatives and begin my 11th year as chair of the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change. So, as far as the shutdown and affecting climate, climate change and all the committees that overlook it, how has it been affected? Well, I think it's delayed our efforts to get down and do some serious business. There's been an awful lot of climate denial and, and a, a kind of a rejection of any kind of uh, policy uh, address uh, towards that uh, major concern. So what we're going to do now, and I wish we had started um, uh, years ago with this, but we were rejected uh, when it came to hearings and, uh, and outreach. But uh, we'll be holding our first hearing on uh, February 6th, uh, which will address the cost of inaction, John, that relates to climate change. Uh, many people, when they hear about a climate change agenda, push back saying, I don't believe the concept, or I believe the concept, but it's going to cost us too much money. So our first hearing will be about the cost of inaction, the recovery costs that communities face, households and businesses face, the damage that is done sometimes in a forever capacity, uh, the impact on public health uh, with carbon in the air, uh, the impact on our oceans and our environment, the need for renewables. So we will see what that cost of inaction is about which will then cement, I think, a positive outcome in the thinking of, of uh, individuals out there across our country that we're already paying a price. Let's uh, produce the savings that can then be reinvested into a climate change agenda. Sounds good. Now, with millennials, what can millennials do in order to impact climate, climate control better? Well, I think that certainly their advocacy is very important and making certain that we take up legislation that will provide for provide for a sounder stewardship of the environment. But then there's also efforts that can be done for weatherization, conservation, energy efficiency, um, advocating and purchasing cars that uh, operate in a more clean capacity. So there are things that we can do individually that calls upon our responsibility of good citizenship in this country. And uh, if we can move towards those efforts of conservation and energy efficiency and buying smart, you know, uh, utilizing some of the smart grid opportunities, those are good opportunities for us to make our individual dent. But I think their advocacy for sound policy that will move us forward in giant steps uh, is also very important. Now, as far as the shutdown goes, what have you seen personally uh, with Americans being affected with that? Oh, I saw a lot of people with undue, unnecessary hardship, people who had just signed for a mortgage for their home, and uh, the very next day they were impacted by the shutdown. I've heard anecdotally of individuals who had to transfer their infant toddler over to the grandparents' home, states away because they don't have money for diapers and formula. Um, I heard from constituents who are trying to save money as a co-payment for their son's transplant that he requires to stay alive. I've heard of people impacted by Lyme disease who could not uh, afford some of the, uh, the efforts that are going towards that, that uh, uh, whole effort. There are those who were missing certain payments. There were those who were asked to contribute to their health care premium because it was denied while we had the shutdown. There were all sorts of untold, unnecessary, painful anecdotes that I have shared on the House floor because I wanted people to know that 
holding hostage 800,000 federal workers uh, and holding hostage the federal programs that they provide to uh, a nation that is well served by their work. Um, all of that was held hostage. I thought it was incredibly bad to put them at risk when they have nothing to do with the border security issue. We need to come to a common table and nail down our border security response, but not hold hostage our federal workers and federal programs. Now, what message do you, do you have to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and then also the current state of America now? Well, the best way to fight um, this administration, I believe, is with facts and data and science. And if we produce significant awareness out there, we all have the task, I think, in good citizenship status to inform people and to do the research and to not uh, take this effort to roll us backward. Um, and, and live with it. We need to fight back. We need to move forward. The progress made under the previous administration with Barack Obama as president um, should not be rolled backward. And when I see the rollbacks of clean air programs, clean power programs, clean car programs, methane rollback in program form, these are, are threatening outcomes because it's, it took a lot of hard work and com you know, compassion and passion to make them real, and now people are just disregarding that hard effort and the facts that accompanied the uh, advocacy and uh, rolling us backward. One last question for you uh, as far as millennials go. What can millennials do to not only help the political process, but, but help you all understand the real problems that they have? Oh, sure. I think communicating really well. I, I think if there's a silver lining to this administration, that it is has inspired advocacy. You know, I just spoke to uh, Saratoga Unites in my district the other day, uh, was one of the uh, speakers for their program, and I thank them for coordinating and collaborating the advocacy outcomes. They helped inspire some of the groups, they helped bring them together, and their forcefulness drove issues like the Women's March, the March for Science, all sorts of efforts that then raised awareness and consciousness that actually changed the majority in the House of Representatives from Republican to Democrat. They deserve a lot of credit for having done that, and I say keep inserting your passion and your intellect and your energy and your concern for our country in a way that will continue to produce forceful change. Thank you so much for taking the time. Okay, my pleasure, John. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to speak with you today, so thanks for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. So my first question is, what was your journey to the U.S. Congress? You know, it, it was long. It was never, ever something that I ever imagined I would do. Um, I, I think I grew up a, a very humble kid, uh, very humble, uh, you know, just an ordinary family. And uh, I just had a lot of, I would say, a lot of good fortune and good luck along the way. Um, I became the first in my family uh, to go to college. Uh, it happened because I joined the Navy when I was 18 years old. Um, I, very, I got picked up for a Navy ROTC scholarship. You know, from there, I uh, just kind of used everything I can, took advantage of every opportunity I had. I, I earned a master's degree, and then I went later and, and got another master's degree from Brown University. And, um, you know, and then uh, when I say, like, I good fortune and struck luck, I actually won the lottery back in 2010. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, just got really involved in, in, in education and really giving kids that same opportunity I had through education to really change their lives. Right. And then after the 2016 presidential election, I just knew I needed to get involved and to really kind of step up and to take, a, you know, try and create more opportunity for more people. Awesome. So that's what I did. That sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. It's been, it sounds like it's been a really fun journey and... It's been, uh, it's been a good journey and you know, I wouldn't change my life for anything and it, it's been fun and exciting and I've had a lot of opportunity to travel the world and see different things and you know, this, this past eight years I've had a lot of opportunity to really go and to change people's lives and give, like I said, give them that same opportunity through education that I had. Um, which for me was transforming and I know a lot of the students that we've been working with it's been transformative for them and uh, now we're just trying to do that same thing in Congress we do it on a larger scale. Right, mm -hmm. awesome. And so what are your priorities in the 116th Congress? You know, uh, one I just talked about, education is a big issue of mine. Like I said, it changed my life and we want to continue to do that and make sure that students today have that same 
opportunity through education that I had, and then we make education more affordable and more accessible for everybody. Um, common sense gun legislation is, is an issue that's very I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, I never got a chance to meet my gr grandfather because he was a victim of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, he died when my mother was just 10 years old. Um, and so it's just something that's always been an issue, a very passionate issue with my family, and it's something that I think we can we can work on. And I'm very happy uh, uh, to support uh, HR House Resolution or you know Bill HR eight, which okay. is uh, going to increase uh, background checks. Uh, immigration reform is another issue that's uh, very important to me, and a lot of the kids uh, that we've worked with, being from California. Our, you know, our kids that, that came here through no fault of their own, mm -hmm. just trying to make a better life for themselves, make a better life for their families. And uh, we need to support them. You yes, know, this, we do. This is their home and this is where they want to make a difference. And why we would want to send those kids away, it makes yeah, no right. sense to me. Right, I agree. Um, I know we want to support the environment, and protect our environment, we want to protect our LGBTQ community. Yeah. So I, I came here with a lot of issues to work on <laughs> and to be supportive of, and I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be working on it. That is awesome. It sounds so good. I like that. And so, what can the American people expect from the Democratic majority in the House, which is the most diverse in history? Mm -hmm. No, it, it's look, it's it's incredible to be in this house with such a, a, a diverse freshman class. Uh, there's over a hundred women here that are here now, which is exciting. And uh, I know we're going to work on a lot of these issues. Um, you know, some of them I mentioned, like common sense gun legislation. Uh, we're going to reform. Uh, the government, you know, make sure that we're protecting uh, voters' rights, giving everybody the opportunity to vote, mm -hmm. um, trying to get dark money out of government. Um, you know, we want to protect our veterans. We want to, you know, make sure that our LGBTQ community uh, gets, has the rights that they should have, that yes. they're guaranteed to them by the Constitution, and that they have the same rights that as every man and woman in this country has and they should have those same equal rights and those are something that we're going to continue to fight for and so i think being uh, such a diverse class everybody's coming from so many different angles and it, it just it, it's exciting to see everybody kind of working together on these issues that you know a lot of these issues really haven't been brought up before and, and, uh, and we're going to address them and we're going to get done and we're going to we're going to make things happen yes mm -hmm. What is your message to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and the future in, in the direction of the country? I, I served this country uh, since I was 18 years old when I first joined the Navy. I have faith in this country. I have faith in the American people in this country. Um, I know now that we have a majority in the House. Uh, the Democratic Party has a majority in the House. Uh, we're going to be able to stand up to the president. Yes. I, I, you saw it right now that just happened with this whole government shutdown. Yes. Um, we weren't going to buckle. We didn't buckle. And he backed down. He did. And uh, we're going to provide oversight. We're going to find out what happened to the two, when, in the 2016 elections. Mm -hmm. uh, we know Russia meddled. But all our uh, intelligence agencies said the Russians meddled in our elections. But we haven't had one hearing. And that's going to change. Um, we're going to have oversight over what the president does now. And so that's what's exciting about this as well. Is there's, there's no more free rides. Uh, he's going to have to answer. His administration is going to have to answer to the House. Um, you know, I, I know the Intelligence Committee is getting ready to hold hearings on, on really uh, the president and everything that's going on. And we're going we're gonna to get down to business and, and really kind of hold this president accountable and you know, take back our country. Yes, indeed. So I'm very excited about that. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and I have one last question for you. How can the millennials become more involved with the politics and the political arena? You know, I, I remember talking to a young woman who, who said um, it, a lot of her classmates, uh, she was just a recent college graduate, that they, they just didn't really see why they should get involved because <laughs> nothing ever changed. It didn't matter who they supported, there was no difference. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I told her, like, you know, if, if yourself and if your friends had gotten involved in 2016, we probably wouldn't have the president <laughs> that we have right now. Very true. So it's there's a definitely a, a big difference when you get involved. Yes. Um, you need to have faith in the system. Mm -hmm. You need to get out there and, and Get involved and, and get involved in a campaign. Get involved in your community. Get involved 
in any way that you can. Uh, and it's you know, and it's up to us as well to engage. You know, our millennials and our, and our young Americans out there to make sure that we're getting them involved. And that's something that you know I worked very hard on during this uh, last campaign. Um, we were definitely out there talking to a lot of communities, whether it be our millennials or whether it be our, our, our Latino community that hasn't really participated in elections um, in the past. And, and that's what we have to continue to do, to get them involved, to get them, give them something that they can be excited about that's right. going to get them involved, and then really deliver on our message. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to doing that. I am too. Right. I'm excited about everything. So right. thank you so, so much well, for speaking with us. It's been a pleasure. It has. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Val. So nice to meet you, Rep. Demings. All right. So let's talk about your top issues. That I find them to be very, very interesting and impactful. So you have gun violence prevention, law enforcement, criminal justice, anti-terror, transportation security. So let's start there. Yeah. You know, I spent 27 years in law enforcement at the Orlando Police Department, served as Orlando's first woman chief of police. And so the reduction of gun violence, uh, certainly as a member of law enforcement, was a top priority for me. Okay. I just was fed up seeing young people dying, really losing their lives for no good reason. Right. And uh, and so when I was elected to Congress in 2016, of course I carried that over into the House. Okay. And uh, you know we've seen people die as a result of gun violence in movie theaters, churches, synagogues, and and. Uh, at concerts and at a nightclub in Orlando. Right. And so we have got to figure out a way to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, terrorists, and mentally ill people. And yes. so it is a top priority for me. Yes. Keeping our nation safe is, of course, a number one priority. Uh, we can talk about jobs and housing and health care and all those other things that mm -hmm. kind of define or frame the American dream. But we've got to be able to do it regardless of the color of our skin yes, or where we live or how much money we have in the bank in a right. safe and secure community. Yes, I and agree. So, um, and so that's very, very important to me. Um, I serve on the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committee okay. and also on Homeland Security. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do. But I'm very, very excited about this Congress. I'm excited about the diversity. Yes, I am too. The greatest number of women that we've ever had in the history of Congress. And so I'm excited about the work ahead. Yes, I am as well. And so tell us about your journey to Congress. You know what? I, uh, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm the youngest of seven children. My mother was a maid and my father was a janitor. Okay. And so what, but what I learned in growing up was that and my mother always taught me, don't let anybody define who you are. You may be black, you might be poor, but you can do anything you want to do or be right. anything you want to be because we live in the greatest country in the world. Yes. That's what we say. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I had an amazing opportunity through hard work and folks who gave me a chance. And uh, when I announced my retirement from the Orlando Police Department as the chief, I was uh, recruited by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. I thought they were out of their minds in the beginning. <laughs> but then I realized that Congress could also give me an opportunity to fight for the people that I care about and the things that I care about. And so now I'm on a mission. I'm one of the co-chairs of candidate recruitment. And so I want to make sure that little girls and boys uh, dream, continue to dream, and that women and men in their various communities, regardless of what their last name is, right. will believe that they can be in Congress, or they can go to med school, or they can be whatever they want to be. And so uh, that's my journey, and I share my story a lot, because people look at me and they see the pen, mm -hmm. but there is a story behind yeah, that pen. Right. And I want to make sure that people can see themselves in the place that they want to be. I love that. That is so inspiring and impactful for everybody. So Thank you. That is good. Thank you. No Thank you. And so what is your advice to millennials who would like to kind of step into the political arena? Let me say this, that uh, we have a lot of goals. We have some big issues in this country. Uh, the country is not going in the right direction right now. But we have the power. Leader Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi now, wrote a book, Know Your Power. Okay. And so I would say to the millennials, which we have all been, yes. <laughs> some it was longer ago than others, but um, know your power. That we can accomplish what we 
need to accomplish without you. Okay. I that we that. need your energy, we need your brains, we need your talent, we need your hopes, dreams, desires. We need you at the table. Okay. And so if the system is not what you think it should be, mm -hmm. then get a seat at the table okay. and help us to be what we need to be. Yes. Right? Because we're not getting another country. This is it. Right. They're not making any more land or water or, you know, the environment. We need to protect it. Right. But we need the talent and energy and skills and abilities of our millennials. Okay. And I have three sons, and I remind them every day. They're millennials. I remind yes. them every day that I can't be what I want need to be mm -hmm. until you are what you need to be. Wow. That's powerful. And we need your power. Yes. Yes. Don't doubt yourself. Okay. Don't listen to those who say, oh, you can't do it. It's not the right time. You're not the right color. You're not the right gender. Your sexual orientation is off. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to that. Okay. Surround yourself with people who will push you mm -hmm. to live up to your full potential. That's, That's my message to the millennials. Okay. And then also, um, what is your thoughts on the impact that the government shutdown has had? The government shutdown in a country that we say is the greatest country in the world is a crying shame. Mm -hmm. We are so much better than that. And if we, in the absence of leadership, bad things happen. That's right. When we have leaders who don't understand that they represent men and women and children, mm -hmm. that they represent families, and that those families are trying to keep a roof over their head and food on the table, mm -hmm. bad things happen. To go without one paycheck is crippling. Right. To go without two, when that's the hard. bills are piling yes. up, that's not supposed to happen in our country. So I would say to the man in the White House and everybody else who calls themselves a leader, mm -hmm. be a leader yes. and never shut the government down over differences, yes. over policy. Yes, I agree. That's not who we are. We're better right. than that. You're right. I love that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Hi, I'm Congressman Gregory Meeks from New York City, Queens and Nassau County. Uh, the 5th Congressional District. All right, thank you so much, Rep Meeks. So my first question is, what is your journey? What was your journey into the U.S. Congress? Well, my journey is, you know, I come from public housing. So I'm a guy from, grew up in East Harlem, moved to Queens, uh, struggled, uh, but then ultimately ended up at Howard University Law School. Uh, and uh, knowing and fought, going through the civil rights movements as a kid, exceeding, my, my movement was always to make a difference. Uh, right. Uh, so I wanted to be an, an attorney, wanted to be an attorney because of uh, the difference that I saw that Thurgood Marshall and others were making, mm -hmm. and I saw that that was my way of improving the community in which I lived in. Uh, and one thing led to another, uh, to the point where, that I'm now here in the United States Congress. Nice, that is amazing, that's awesome. And what are your priorities for the 116th Congress? Well, I sit on two committees. Okay. I sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee, where I am on the subcommittees of the Western Hemisphere and Europe. Okay. But most importantly, I sit on the Financial Services Committee, uh, working with uh, Maxine Waters, but where I am the chair of uh, Consumer Protection and in financial institutions, okay. uh, which means that we have all of the banks and all of the financial institutions in America under mm -hmm. our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we want to do is try to make sure that consumers get a fair shake, okay. uh, creating wealth. Uh, and when you look at what took place after the 2008 financial crises, African Americans in particular lost a great deal of wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the way uh, that fraudulent mortgages uh, were sold and individuals were put into uh, no document loans, etc. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that never happens again. Uh, we also want to make sure that the financial institutions are diverse. Okay. Uh, in their C suites, in their board, on their board of directors, uh, in their mid management levels where people can move and grow up, mm -hmm. uh, and grow up the, uh, the chain. We think that's tremendous so that they are looking and uh, like America. So I have a bill that I put in basically requiring financial institutions to disclose their diversity. Okay, that's uh, good. And so uh, that's something that's very important what we're focused on. Uh, and making sure that folks can control their own data uh, also. So that's what we're looking to do on the subcommittee that I, that I chair. Okay. Uh, Community Reinvestment Act uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that people are investing in communities where they're doing business. Uh, so those are all agenda items that uh, 
I'm going to be putting forward as chairman of this subcommittee. Okay, well, we look forward to that. That all sounds great. That's amazing. And so how can millennials become involved in the political arena? Well, look, it starts from uh, just knocking on somebody's door and saying, mm -hmm. well, one, make an inquiry about the issues and about what uh, those of us who are elected are about and saying, I want to be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to get in the streets and I want to make sure that those issues that are of concern to me are uh, articulated and, and pushed. You know, what has happened, which is miraculous and in one sense, but fantastic overall, is the participation of millennials in politics and they're making a difference. You know, once upon a time, you know, people were just looking at seniors mm -hmm. uh, and the issues are, of millennials uh, were not included. But having two millennial daughters <laughs> and one that may be is younger in that, she's just a sophomore in college, okay. uh, and dealing with their issues and my, and, and, and my oldest daughter particularly being very involved in politics. Uh, I've seen how she's gone from not having an interest to mm -hmm. this is my future. Yes, and that's I'm going to have a voice in there. Uh, and so what she did was um, volunteered on campaign. Did some nice. research on candidates and volunteered on campaigns uh, to the point that she's even now the uh, uh, senior uh, advisor to the speaker of the oh, New York wow. City Council. That's impressive. Um, and she didn't do that because of me. Right. Uh, she did that on her own. So uh, I think just being involved because, um, believe it or not, I once was a quote unquote millennial. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. at that time when I was in high school and college, uh, I wanted, and that's what the Civil Rights Movement was all about even before me. It was all young people saying that we want to make a difference. Yes. And, and, and getting involved in politics has helped me make that difference. That's good. And my last question is, what do you feel the lasting impact of the government shutdown will have on America? Well, number one, we know that it's already cost America over $6 billion in economic activity. Uh, number two, we know that uh, we have a system where we've got to stop these shutdowns mm -hmm. that are holding, uh, in this case, 800,000 workers hostage to a president's um, political campaign promise. Mm -hmm. Not something that is of real policy and, and a benefit to the American people overall. That's right. So it, it has a negative aspect in that, but the positive that I hope that comes out of this is that we pass some legislation yes. that says never again can anybody hold mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a group of people basically hostage right. over their own political agenda. Very good. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you right. so much, Rep. Meeks. Nice it was pleasure. a pleasure. Hi, I'm Congressman Mark Takano. Uh, I represent the 41st District which uh, of California, which is located in Southern California between Los Angeles and Palm Springs. Kind of gives you an idea where I'm from. And uh, before I was elected to Congress, I was a high school teacher for about 24 years, and I served on a local community college board as an elected community college trustee for about 22 years. So I, I bring a lot of education background to my policymaking role here in Congress. Um, I'm the first openly gay person of color elected to Congress, and I'm also the first openly gay person of color to actually chair a full committee in Congress, this Congress. I'm very excited about that. And um, if you didn't know it, uh, I'm going to tell you now, uh, but uh, I'm the, the Congress we elected in 2018 is the gayest Congress in history that we know of. It is, it's true, it's the gayest Congress in history, and I underscore that we know of, because there might have been more gays in Congress at one time than we know now, but they were on the down low, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, my first, my first question, you already would let us know about your journey, you were a teacher, um, a major way to Congress. What does it mean for the LGBTQ community for you to be the first chair uh, person of color um, to be openly gay? Well, it means that uh, I pay attention to things that I think someone with a different background would not pay attention to. So, what I, I'm the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee, and you know, I'm asking the question: uh, Where does the VA need to be uh, by 2030? How does it need to be positioned so that it can adequately serve? 
uh, an increasingly diverse veteran population. We know that there are more women who are serving in the military. We know that since the overturning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that people can serve openly in the military and, uh, you know, there's going to be more uh, LGBT people that we have to serve who are veterans. And we know that people of color are increasingly serving in the military. They've always been a part of the military, but it's going to go more diverse as our country goes more diverse. So we need a VA uh, that can provide health care to our diverse population. Um, you know, we think about LGBT people, they have a different set of health care needs, right? Uh, African Americans uh, have health care needs that are not the same as everybody else. And we need a, we need a, a Veterans, a veterans Health Care Administration that is prepared to take all that on. So I think someone, I think somebody who's not LGBTQ and a person of color could probably also care about this stuff, but I think I'm in a position as chairman to really care about this stuff. So what are your priorities when it comes to the 116th Congress? Well, my priorities, I have a lot of priorities related to veterans, making sure that we provide health care to our veterans that's timely and of high quality. Um, I happen to believe that there are people in the Trump administration who want to privatize and allow people to profiteer off of VA care and to divert money away from uh, VA health care. Uh, that would be a mistake. Uh, so one of my priorities is to make sure that we have the right balance of private sector care that's outsourced, but we also make sure that we build up the VA uh, from inside. Um, I want to make sure that uh, veteran students, student veterans are not uh, uh, exploited by the for-profit college uh, uh, industry. Uh, you know, the for-profit college industry uh, lures students in with deceptive marketing. Uh, and it doesn't just hurt veterans, it hurts students of color, low-income students, first-time students who may not be uh, in the best position to understand the different institutions that are out there. And they may be making some choices that are influenced by the heavy marketing rather than uh, the quality of institutions. So that's a high part. I, I hate seeing veterans ripped off. I hate seeing students ripped off. Uh, so it's about protecting students, protecting student veterans. Um, I, of course, am interested in um, higher education. I also sit on the Education and Labor Committee, on the Higher Education Committee, and I want to make sure, I know that your audience is, uh, you know, young, young folk, and uh, they may be worried about being able to pay for college without going into a lot of debt. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I want to make sure we get the bad actors, the bad for-profit uh, colleges uh, out of the way, uh, even shut them down, uh, make sure they can't waste taxpayer money, but also make sure that opportunities to get an affordable education without uh, crippling debt, debt-free education, uh, we need to work on uh, for, your, for your readers and viewers out there. Uh, that's a high priority, and that comes from, you know, my passion as an educator. Now, one question uh, with our viewers: <clears throat> now, you you are openly uh, a person of color, and right. I'm sure you went through a lot of different turmoil and a lot of different things. And with the state of our country now, and, you know, there's a lot of you know young ones and millennials who are dealing with a lot of bullying and things of that nature. Yeah. Tell us about some of the things that you went through as you rise through Congress, and then also how you went. And well, that's a, you know, I, I, as a young person, I was very much, you know, I was inspired by someone who later turned out to be gay that I didn't know. That was Barbara Jordan. Um, we know in retrospect that she was a lesbian, but at the time she wasn't out. I didn't know that. Uh, but it was interesting, as a young boy, I was age, I don't know, 12, 13, I, I was watching her uh, as a congresswoman on the House Judiciary Committee that was drafting the Articles of Impeachment against Richard Nixon. And she gave an opening speech that absolutely inspired me. And I, and I, as a, as a seventh grader, as a, between my sixth and seventh grade uh, grades, I, I, I made a, a, a goal. I said, I want to be like Barbara Jordan. Uh, she inspired me as a person of color. I said, if a black woman could be elected member of Congress, so could I. And uh, 
uh, the irony is I, would, I was watching her in the living room of my, great, of my grandfather, who was my only immigrant grandfather, who was uh, interned during World War II and lost all of his property. Uh, and the Constitution didn't work for him. Um, and Barbara Jordan talked about in her speech how the Constitution, how she believed in it, and what an amazing thing it was for her to be what she called an inquisitor. Uh, so, the, you know, I want to, I'm laying all this as a background because I set goals to go to the best universities I could get into. Uh, I planned from early age to try to get into politics. But then, when I graduated from college in the 80s, um, I wasn't, that, the AIDS crisis came upon the country. A lot of homophobia descended uh, into the country. And I began to have doubts about whether I had, was called the right calling. And uh, so much so that I, I think I experienced depression uh, in my mid-20s. And uh, I was moping around the house, um, eating a lot of pizza. Uh, and um, you know, I imagine like a lot of uh, veterans who just went and did the most amazing thing fighting on behalf of our country, come back and they find out the road uh, to getting a job and a career uh, isn't as smooth as they thought it was going to be. We got a lot of LGBT people who are young people who may have doubts about whether they could see, succeed in this world. Uh, especially seeing the news even today of uh, Jesse Smollett, um, uh, an actor in Empire who was attacked uh, ostensibly because he was LGBTQ. Um, so when LGBT young people see this sort of thing happen, uh, when they see trans people uh, being denied military service, they see things going backwards, um, I think people get concerned, they might get afraid. And all I can say is that uh, one of my brothers really helped me through my moment in my 20s and basically said, you can't keep the family worried about you. You know, you need to start making progress on your goals. And, um, uh, you know, it was really important that a member of my family was, was there for me. Uh, I know that some of your, 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 your viewers may not have family that's that supportive. Uh, but I want, them, I want those viewers to know that I'm a member of Congress today because I stuck it out, uh, but because so many other LGBT people out there were brave and decided to live their lives with honesty and courage uh, and dignity, uh, and that helped change society. And we still have much more society to change. So, uh, and we have one more question for you. Sure. So regarding our viewers, millennials, what can millennials do to affect uh, the, the process of, of politics? You know, millennials, you helped elect the most diverse Congress in history. You helped elect the gayest Congress in history. And you helped elect unprecedented numbers of women, minority women, black women in Congress, um, Latino, Latinas to Congress. Uh, and it's because you became engaged uh, that you became woke and don't go back to sleep again uh, stay engaged uh, some of you were working on campaigns for the first time in your lives uh, don't make that your last campaign because uh, I don't believe progress is inevitable that there's some magic force out there that's going to make everything okay uh, that you know so while as we walk this earth God's work has to be our own work and that's just not my words, that's a paraphrase of John F. Kennedy's inaugural speech. Um, that, um, that it begins with caring, it begins with believing that you can make the world a better place. Uh, and to not, to, not be, uh, to not be set back, to not take the set back. Look, we, we lived under eight years of Obama and it looked like progress was never been. And this country was on a course. And we, none of us, few, few of us ever thought, oh, we go from eight years of Obama to a guy that takes the White House who is just wrong. Uh, and that's evidence that progress is inevitable and that it takes people, all people, especially young people. You make the difference. 
because you showed up at the polls, we now have a different Congress. And um, I thank you for that, but don't quit. Don't stop. Stay woke, as Anthony Maxine would say. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'm Congressman Jim McGovern. I represent the 2nd Congressional District in uh, Massachusetts, and I'm a Democrat. Awesome. I'm the chairman of the House Rules Committee, too. Oh, very good. That's, that's awesome. So what was your journey to the U.S. Congress? You know, I, I, my journey was I, when I was in middle school, I cared deeply about, about politics. Uh, uh, there was a presidential election going on. It was 1972. The candidates were Richard Nixon, the incumbent, and a guy named George McGovern, who was running against Nixon, who was the peace candidate. And I thought McGovern had a good last name. Um, <laughs> yes. And I ended up, you know, volunteering his campaign. And I felt great overjoyed when he won Massachusetts overwhelmingly. But I was depressed he lost 49 other states. But I came to Washington in college and I worked with George McGovern, learned a lot from him. Um, he was a man who stood for justice and peace and civil rights and equal rights. And then I um, you know, worked for another congressman from Boston, a guy named Joe Moakley, and did a lot of work on human rights. Uh, and then um, you know, one day um, in 1996, I decided I was going to run for Congress because I, the person who was representing my district was a New Gingrich Republican and I thought I could do better and everybody thought it was a bad idea. But I did it anyway, and lightning struck, and I won, and I've been coming back ever since. <laughs> Sounds so good. <laughs> and what are your priorities in the, the 116th Congress? Yeah, I mean, one is I, I wanted, um, one of my focuses is on ending hunger um, and food insecurity in this country. We live in the richest country in the history of the world, and there are 40 million Americans who don't know where the next meal is going to come from. And as the United States Congressman, I'm ashamed of that. I mean, we need to do better. Hunger is a political condition. Uh, we can end it if we have the political will. And yes. so I focus a lot on issues of food insecurity, hunger, poverty. Uh, I care deeply about the climate crisis um, and um, also about human rights. I co-chair the Human Rights Commission in Congress. And I believe that the United States stands for anything. We need to stand out loud and four square for human rights. Um, and uh, I personally believe that we can do more good around the world by, you know, by helping uh, provide food and deal with extreme poverty uh, than all the military hardware we ship all around the world to these dictators that use it against their own people. Yes, I agree. That's awesome. And my next question is, what can the American people expect from the Democratic majority in the House, which is the most diverse in history? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited it's the most diverse in history, and that's thanks to the American people for getting out and voting. Uh, and I think what you're going to expect is us trying to move big issues. I mean, whether it's Medicare for all, or whether it's dealing with the climate crisis, or whether it's taking on issues of poverty and food insecurity in this country, uh, whether it's a big infrastructure bill to rebuild our country, or you know, or to find ways to make college education more affordable. Uh, but we believe in investment. We believe in lifting people up, and um, and you know, we, we have to deal with the divided Congress, and we have to deal with the. The man in the White House who's, you know, I mean, I don't want to get me started, but the bottom line is, um, you know, we're going to start laying the groundwork for major change in this country. Uh, you know, our whole slogan during the last campaign was, you know, for the people. Um, I mean, that's where our heart and soul is. We're for the people. We're not for the corporations. We're not for the well-connected or the well-off. We're for the, for the people. Uh, and uh, we're going to do our best to deliver on our promises. Okay. Very good. And what are the lasting impacts that you feel um, the government shutdown will have on the country? You know, one is I, 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 the, the government shutdown represent, represented to me an all-time high in recklessness and stupidity. I mean, hundreds of thousands of federal workers went without a paycheck. I mean, it was so disrespectful. And their lives have been torn apart because a lot of them live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. I mean, the majority of federal workers earn under $60,000 a year. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I, I think it's created this uncertainty. Uh, in this country that is uh, that is not healthy for our economy and also it cost the American taxpayer 11 billion dollars wow. for this stupid shutdown so um, you know we need to be strong um, and make sure that um, you know we don't allow this to ever happen again um, and we need to make it clear to the president that uh, if he shuts the government down again uh, there's gonna be hell to pay I mean uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, absolutely this I mean this man um, you know, look, I mean, when I hear people in his administration say, you know, people who haven't gotten paid, go get a bridge loan or something like that. I mean, I, I, you wonder, like, what planet are they living on? Right, I right. mean, not everybody go to their daddies like Donald Trump did and get a <laughs> $6 million loan. Yes. I mean, the bottom line is real people live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and um, and so, um, so, look, I mean, we, you know, we're part of the resistance, but... How to resist this means not only opposing things, but actually pushing forward an agenda that we think is really going to help the people that we 
uh, that elected us. Great. Thank you so much for that. Okay. What is your message to Americans who are concerned about Donald Trump and the future direction of our country? Well, I'm concerned as hell about Donald Trump, to be honest with you. I mean, I, you know, if you're concerned, you need to raise your voices, you need to stand up, you need to fight back. You can't give up, um, you know, because we can, re we can take our government back. Uh, and so my message is just, you know, stay tough. Uh, don't give in. Don't give up hope. I mean, we need to, we, need, we all need to join together. We need to fight back. And I think if we do, you know, better days are ahead of us. And my last question yep. is, how can millennials become more involved in the political arena? You know what? I mean, I, my first political experience was I was in middle school, right? The way you get involved is you just get involved. I mean, you can, you know, you all have power. Use it. Um, you know, if, if 10 people show up to a congressional office, that's like a, a mini movement. If 20 people show up, it's a bigger movement. I mean, I mean, you can change things. Uh, and, you know, they, you know, I used to have an old history professor who used to end every class by saying the world will not get better on its own. I didn't quite appreciate what he meant when I was taking this class. I, I now know what he meant. I mean, nothing changes in this country for the better unless like-minded people come together and demand change. I mean, I, you know, John Lewis, the great civil rights leader who's in Congress, reminds us all the time that the civil rights movement, you know, was not just about older people marching, it was about younger people, people in their teens, people in their early 20s, you know, who, who, who joined these marches, who demanded change, and who made this, pushed this country in a better direction. We need to, we need to understand what our power is, we need to be united, because when we're united, we're strong. And we just need to push forward. This is your country, you know. Uh, as much as it is my country, as much as it is Donald Trump's country, you know, stand for what you believe in and fight for it. It's worth it. Yes. Thank you so much for Thank that. You. And again, we are here with Congress Member Jim McGovern. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's good to be with you. Thank you. I'm Jonathan with Millbuzz. Thank you so much for joining us. We had so many great people we got to interview. Patrice even talked to Maxine Waters. Now, you have to do your part too, so make sure you stay tuned with everything that we have going on and make sure that you figure out how you can continue to help Congress because we are the voice. Thank you again so much for joining Millbuzz. I love it. Yes, I did.